Bonsoir. I'm sorry. Good evening. All right. Well, we welcome you here to our, gosh, the year is going by so rapidly, huh? This is May. And next month will be the middle, huh? Okay. Well, thank you so much for being here. And um, if you're here for the first time, welcome to the Fairfield Town Hall meetings. We've been having those since, I think, 1998. Long time. Long time. And uh, what is the purpose? The purpose of these meetings is kind of simple. It is to make sure that you, as residents of Henrico County, are given the most recent and pertinent and pertinent information <laughs> that you need to know. Because we believe, and I know that you agree, that the citizens who are on top of what's going on as to where they live is always a better place because they can make better decisions. And we have a good program for you tonight. Uh, listen, we're going to listen to topics. Animal safety, noise, ordinances, community maintenance, code violations. And I thought also since that uh, I hadn't seen you since last month, you've been seeing a lot of things on the news. So we have a little extra for you. We have the uh, director of finance here, because you've heard something, read something about car taxes and all that good stuff. So you need to know what is the latest. So we're going to add that as an addendum. So you say, well, Ms. Thornton, what about this? So I, I can't answer it as well as she can. And so I asked her to be here, and she is here. OK, OK, let's get started. Do I have a volunteer to give us an invocation? Going once. OK? Good evening, everyone. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you and we bless you on tonight. We thank you for our life, health, and strength. We thank you for how you've guided our steps this far, Lord. Thank you for keeping us all from hurt, harm, and danger and allowing us to survive even through this difficult time of pandemic and war and other things that are going on around us. So now, Lord, we'd ask that you would bless this meeting and bless all those here and allow us to have an opinion that will not be uh, taken the wrong way, but it will be greeted with love and understanding that we're all here to accomplish one thing, to make our neighborhoods better. We ask these things in the precious name of our son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Excuse me. Tell them who you are. My name is Pastor Preston Gaynor. I'm the HOA president for Montezuma Village over here. I've been there for the last uh, 15 years, but I just became the president maybe four years ago. And uh, we're trying to do some things in the community. But uh, if you're in Montezuma Village, I don't seem to recognize anybody in my area. But uh, I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. And what's so beautiful about that, I could have called on you. And you could have done the invocation. And that's, uh, you know, that's the kind of county we want to live in. I remember going in a grocery store not too long ago. And I also had a tie on. And the clerk says, you must be a preacher. And uh, I say, why do you say that? Uh, she said, well, how you dressed? So I guess that says preachers dress rather well. I don't know. Okay, we'll see. Ladies and gentlemen, we are happy to start our program off tonight by a young man that whenever I get some calls from you about community, particularly about things like tall grass and some other things, I call Mr. Johnson my point man. So at this time, I want to introduce a person who's been with the county Good while also, and uh, he'll tell you a little about himself. Uh, well, let me tell you a little bit about him. Uh, Paul Johnson was hired in 1997. Hey, that's pretty good. As the county's first community maintenance manager. Since then, he has strived to, be, to support the livability and sustainability of Henrico's residential neighborhoods and commercial districts. To that end, his team enforces the county's environmental and zoning ordinances and sponsors citizen assistance and community improvement projects to reduce blight influences. 
Paul earned a bachelor's degree in urban studies and a master's degree in public administration from Virginia Commonwealth University in the 1980s. Before starting with the county, he worked as a town manager and deputy city manager in the state of Michigan. Uh, when not working, Paul likes reading, riding his bike, and enjoying other outdoor activities. Paul. Thank you, Mr. Thornton. And by the way, I think it was at one of your town hall meetings in 1997. I'm not, not exactly sure, but um, I did ride 52 miles on my bike yesterday. A little sore today. It's like 2,600 feet of climbing. I ride about 5,000 miles a year. So it really helps me keep in shape, and, and I really enjoy it. So I spend a lot of time doing that. But I want to talk about community revitalization, just a little bit about our department before we start. So, so the department and our various programs literally have the potential of impacting every property and every resident in, in Henrico County. Uh, we have the block grant programs, the federal housing programs. We've seen a lot of relief money come to the federal government over the last couple of years during the COVID pandemic. A lot of those funds have uh, gone through our department to businesses, to nonprofits, to individual citizens. So we've been very, very busy with that over the last 18 months. We also have uh, two Enterprise Zone programs. We've got one called the Enterprise Zone, another one called the HIP program. Both of them help support small businesses. For the most part, they are small businesses. They're in two distinct zones that we have in the county. And if you want a, one of these brochures, there's a few at the table in the back. Just grab one on the way out. So those are some of our major activities. But I want to talk about the community maintenance program. And let's see here if I can get this to work. Let's see here. Do I point this? What do I point this at? Okay, that's that's fine. So, uh, Mr. Thornton mentioned blighting influences, and that's something we never want to see in the county. We don't want to see it in commercial districts. We don't want to see blighting influences in residential districts. And all the codes that we enforce, Chapter 10 and Chapter 24, are really aimed at making sure that Henrico is a safe place to live that things look good, we have a healthy environment, and that people always feel comfortable reinvesting in their own property, their own neighborhood, and also reinvesting in their business. All those things are very, very important to long-term uh, sustainability in the county. You can go to the next one. Thank you. Um, we have a community cleanup uh, program that we work on. We have sponsored cleanups around the county in certain selected neighborhoods. Thank you, is it working now? Yeah. yeah. And we'll do that every so often. We'll come in, we'll, we'll help people get the excess trash and debris and junk and things that they don't need out to the curb. We'll pick it up, we'll haul it away. And that has been one of the things we've done, done for many, many years. We had to modify the program recently, but it's still out there. It's still one of the initiatives that we look to to help keep neighborhoods looking great. We have a lot to do with HOAs. I think I probably know a lot more about HOAs than I would like to at this point. Um, but when HOAs are started, the documents flow through our office. We look at the declarations, read them over, make commentary on the, on the declarations, which is one of the founding documents of any HOA, and uh, see that they get in, in, in the good shape uh, so that they, they're sustainable over the long term. Okay. This is kind of an interesting chart. It shows our case history over the years, and what you're seeing is a bar chart with numbers at the top. Those are the code violations that we have dealt with in any single year. We see that they peaked out in 17, fiscal year 17, 18, a few years back. Then we had the numbers decline a little bit. And then we hit COVID. So during COVID, we did things a lot differently. We weren't as aggressive issuing notices of violation. We were working with people a lot. Uh, we weren't getting as many complaints because people weren't going outside. They weren't seeing, seeing the code violations. And we weren't proactive, meaning we weren't driving around looking for code violations because we didn't want to have a lot of contact with people. We didn't people, want people to have contact with us. But we're getting back to normal now. 
and uh, our inspectors will be out there. We're, we're taking complaints. We're responsive to complaints now fully, and we are proactive now. So that's something um, that we'll be working on. If you ever have concerns about anything in your neighborhood, you can always call us. And the contact information is in the brochures that you picked up in the bags up front. Also, we have a number of new staff persons, so we're in the process of training them. We'll probably see these numbers go up a little bit over the next couple of years as we continue to uh, get things back to normal. The chart on the left shows our uh, voluntary compliance and non-voluntary compliance rates, and it's 95%, which is really good. What that means is when we open a case and we go knock on somebody's door, leave a flyer, leave a brochure, start talking to them about a code violation that we see on the property, can be proactive, could be upon complaint, that 95% of the time that person removes the violation and we don't have to do an abatement, we don't have to necessarily issue a notice of violation, and we don't have to take them to court. So we're very, very proud of that. Um, individual circumstances are important to us. We just don't want to be the heavy-handed government coming after people. We want to work with people. If we see a hardship, we want to try and bring some assistance to that person, and we do that all the time. Sometimes people can't correct some of the things that are going on on their property uh, for different reasons. Sometimes they need more time on the case because they're face facing a personal family hardship. And we want to work with them as individuals and consider their circumstances. So, but we're still very proud of that 95% compliance rate without taking enforcement action. The uh, case status information on the right reflects our number of abatements, our court cases, and our aging cases over the years. Our abatements is when we see trash or debris or tall grass and the property owner doesn't clean it up. We actually have to send a contractor out to clean up the property and then we end up building the property owner. Those numbers go up and down. They were 290, estimated to be 352 for the year that we're in. Those numbers aren't especially high. They're, they're very reasonable if you look back at them historically. Court cases, they vary a lot. They're mostly for vehicles. Sometimes they're for zoning violations. We probably have more vehicle cases over the course of a year than zoning violations, but we have some of those too. Last year, 68 zoning violations. This year, 36. Um, and aging cases are those over uh, 90, uh, 190 days. Uh, last year, we carried about 128 per month over the year, and we're at about 119 this year. So we're doing a little bit better, getting the cases closed in a timely manner. So our approach, let me focus in on this a little bit, because this, the things I'm going to go over now really are the keys to the success of our community maintenance program. And by the way, these things were discussed very, at the very beginning. I've been doing this since 1997. When I was, literally when I was hired, some of these principles were discussed uh, in, within the county management, discussed with me, and they include a number of things that I'll point out. Uh, cases are open proactively and by complaint. We do that. I think if you look at the county as a whole, we're probably about 60% proactive. And um, when I first came, though, they, they, weren't, they weren't proactive. Um, it was only, only upon complaint. But at a town hall meeting with Mr. Thornton and another supervisor, citizens expressed a concern about us being out in a community and not taking action when we see a code violation. And it wasn't more than a couple of days after that meeting that I was instructed, no, we're going to be proactive now. If, we're, if we see violations in the field, we're going to start working those cases. But we're going to work with the property owner in a friendly, non-aggressive manner. And that really has been our approach ever since 1997. Um, we seek voluntary compliance. I already mentioned our voluntary compliance rate. We're doing very well with that. The initial contacts are made with educational brochures. You know, we found that most people want to comply with the code. They just don't know about it. They've never had this violation before in their property. Um, maybe they're new, new to a neighborhood or they've transferred in from out of town. They're not familiar with Henrico County and they didn't know it was a code violation. We give an educational brochure like the ones you see in the bags you picked up and most people will come into compliance just, just after reading that. So we appreciate that um, very much. As I said, individual circumstances are considered. If somebody's having an issue, we can negotiate with them, and we do. We just want to, want to reach compliance on a reasonable timeline. So one of, the inspect one of the things we've asked inspectors to do when they go to a door is try to figure out if this person needs help. You know, if somebody is elderly, if they're frail, if it doesn't look like they're capable of cleaning up that junk in their yard. And I'll never forget a case that I had in a neighborhood in Rico where I was driving down the street one day with somebody in a county car. We saw this elderly woman trying to drag this, this um, big box out 
like of her side yard, and we stopped to help her. And we started talking to her, and she explained to us that her husband had recently passed away, and behind a, a, a fence and a hedge next to her house, there was a whole vacant lot that her husband had filled up with junk, and unfortunately he had passed away, and she was left with this to, to clean it up. So we arranged to have volunteers and others come in and remove that junk for her because we knew uh, being elderly and low income, she didn't have the means of having those items removed. So one of the things I really love about this job is, yes, we have enforcement action that we can take, but we're also looking for opportunities to help people who really need help. And I think that one thing has really been a key for the program over the many, many years. So we do negotiate reasonable deadlines when, there, when there's a violation. And if somebody is making progress, let's say they get rid of half of the junk in their yard and the inspector goes out on a reinspection, they'll say, look, you've come a long way. You've got taken care of half of this. Why don't I give you another week or two and you can finish, it off, finish removing the stuff. So if we see steady progress and removing a violation, we'll give more time. And I can think of extreme cases where we literally gave uh, people like a year. We had a gentleman out in the West End who had uh, a huge backyard. It was several acres, and he had 30 to 40 cars in that, in that yard. And he, we asked him to get rid of the cars, and we worked with him for a full 12 months while he got rid of those cars. So, but we could see the steady progress when we would come out, and that's, that's all that we want to do uh, to reach compliance. Court action abatements are used in 5% of all the cases. Of course, that goes with the voluntary compliance rate. It's relatively low. And chronic code violators and businesses are likely to be given less time to comply. We use the tough love approach, I like to call it. If somebody has a history with the county, you know, we have a database where we keep track of all of our case information. If an inspector can go in that database and they can see, oh my gosh, we've had three cases a year, a couple of cases a year on this property for the last several years, we may treat that a little bit differently than if somebody just has a violation for the first time on their property. So we do, we do take that kind of thing into consideration. That really is sort of the basis for our, our approach, and I think that those things, more than anything else, are the key uh, to the success, long-term success of our program. And I think, really, we, in order to get the buy-in from the public, we had to have the code enforcement, but we also had to have the opportunities to work with people, uh, to make referrals, to other agencies. We even make referrals to uh, uh, nonprofits that get block grant funds, for example. If we see a house that's in disrepair, elderly person living in that house, we're probably going to make a referral to that nonprofit agency that got federal funds through the county. Maybe they can get on a waiting list. Maybe they can get a housing uh, rehab project on that property. So we're always looking for those opportunities in the county. And uh, we've asked our inspectors to look for them because and, and, we want every house to look great. This just shows some photos of a few violations. Obviously, that's tall grass there on the le top left. And the inspectors are very, very busy with tall grass cases. I had one tell me last week he could probably open up 150 a week right now if he wanted to. Again, the approach is going to be, for the most part, the property owner or tenant will come home and they'll see a card and brochure about tall grass on their property, and they usually get it cut. We give them about um, five days to do that, seven with a weekend. In upper motor vehicles, uh, they are a problem from time to time. Uh, I think uh, not as much as, as a problem as they used to be. The cases are down a little bit, but a vehicle is inoperable if it doesn't run, if the license plate is expired, or if the inspection is expired. But again, we work with people. We've had a difficult time with COVID getting the DMV. Anybody experience that? Yeah, so that's, that's been, we've heard people say, Paul, I can't get an appointment at DMV for three months. I don't know if that's still going on, but. But we extended cases quite a bit because of the issues with DMV and, and the difficulties we knew that people were having actually getting into DMV and getting what they needed from them. And the next one over to the right is, is uh, trash and debris. Uh, we can do abatements on trash and debris. Again, we give people some time. You know, We do worry about trash and debris because there's something we see, it brings rats. And we're very, very concerned with that. Sir, you have a question? Yes, back it up to the vehicle. Yes, sir. Uh, park. On the Michael Street. Yes, sir. Uh, we were told because there's a bus in our subdivision that's been sitting in the same spot for 10 years. Okay. Or longer. Yep. But because of the license plate, we were told uh, there's nothing they can do about it. Uh, what is it about the license plate? I think they said it's not with Brooke. Where's the. Uh, uh, Parker, are you here? 
<laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. Well, anyway, yeah. okay, what did they tell you about that license plate? He's right there. Uh, what did they tell you about that license plate when we can't move the bus? Did they tell you they can't do anything about that bus on Morton Street? It's an ANC license plate. Oh, they're like they're on the bus at Parker Street. They have antique tags on it, and they say ain't nothing they can do about it. It has never been moved. It has never been moved at all. It just popped out. It's been there for a year, a year or two years. Yeah. Before I leave, if you can give me more specific information, I will do some research into that case and get back with you. Um, now, there are some quirky things. We had an issue many years ago where somebody got a GRTC bus, and uh, they decided they were going to convert it, but they didn't convert it. They just bought it, and they hadn't gotten to converting it, right? So this bus was out in the West End, and uh, it was like this odyssey where I chased this bus around the West End over a series of three or four months, and, you know, it's hard to hide a GRTC bus, right? Um, so we, we did that and we, we took the person to court and we weren't even thinking about this. Somehow the owner had registered it as an RV. So the judge threw the case out. So I don't know if that's what's happened with this situation, but I do want to look into it in depth and, and get some, some very specific answers to what's going on in this, in this situation. So uh, I'll do that. See me afterwards, please. Uh, so again, we do work on trash and debris. We abate it you know, when, when we have to. We do charge the property owner. Uh, for the abatement, we have a company on contract uh, who was hired on a bid process approved by the county and uh, then that bill, uh, we pay the contractor and then the, the county will bill the property owner for the abatement of that. Uh, commercial vehicles, so there are a lot of restrictions for commercial vehicles in residential areas. 10,000 pounds of gross vehicle weight and that's something that the Board of Supervisors raised several years ago. We do want to be friendly to businesses. There are a lot of tradesmen that drive trucks and uh, we wanted to allow them to have some of those trucks uh, in residential neighborhoods, but 10,000 pounds gross vehicle weight is the limit. Above that, uh, uh, that's, that's too big for residential district. Also, for less than 10,000 pounds of gross vehicle weight, you can have a commercial vehicle, but you can't have a fleet of them. For example, if I have a little electric company and I've got a van, I can have that van. I drive it home every day. I'm a small business person, but I can't have several employees report to my property all picking up their vans from my property. So you're limited to, to one of those commercial vehicles uh, on the property, less than 10,000 pounds of gross vehicle weight. And junk and outside storage, uh, this is something that we see from time to time. The difference with junk is we have to take it to court, and that's under Chapter 24 of the Zoning Ordinance, and our only remedy in those situations is, is court action. So junk cases get extended out a little bit longer because we have to do a court warning letter, we have to do a summons, the summons and court dates are six weeks out from the charge date, um, and then usually the judges may give them some time to comply. We're not necessarily, for a first time violator, we're not necessarily going for a conviction either when we get someone in court. Usually it's just another place where we can work something out um, with, with the property owner, and the judges uh, like to see that happen as well. So, so a lot of times cases get continued and they'll be, we'll be able to come back, say, a month later, and the judge can say, ask the person, did you remove the, you know, the, the, the junk storage? And they can say yes, and we can close our case. Any, other, any questions about code violations, though? Those kinds of basic code violations. We work commercial properties, and we work residential properties. And I'll just mention on commercial properties, when a commercial property is developed, there's what's called a plan of development. And it's a whole long list of things is the best way to describe it about what's in that original development. All of those things have to be maintained, whether it's parking lots, whether it's signage, whether it's landscaping, curbing, guttering, whatever, uh, drainage, there's a whole long list of things. Over time, some of those things may fall into disrepair, and that's where we come in and we start working with the property owner to see that it's, it's brought back up to standard. There was a question back there. Oh, let's see. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Gene Barber. I live in Stonely, and I wonder, is there a difference are you the one that comes to our property to say, our mailbox needs painted or? Thankfully, no. <laughs> so, yes, yes. Let, let me just explain that for a minute. So, uh, under Virginia law, if you have a piece of common area, and this really started with BMPs, BMPs are those little, little drainage ponds that you see around everywhere. And legally, when a subdivision is set up, if there's a piece of common area, in that subdivision, you have to have an HOA under state law. Therefore, everybody's a member. 
of it. Now, people kind of like HOAs. They're popular. They have, uh, they have a whole other level of restrictions that Henrico County doesn't have. So it could be things like the color of a mailbox, not just whether it's painted or not. It could be the bushes in your yard. It could be the, the, the paint on your house, the siding, the roofing. They can regulate all manner of things. Those things are set up, generally speaking, in the covenants when the subdivision is first started. And those are the covenants that we review when the development process is, is first beginning. So we're not, no, our agency is not the one that would come and tell you to paint your mailbox, but a local HOA is responsible for enforcing the restrictions in their own covenants. Right. Well, actually, we're here, I'm here for another reason, and I'm going to get Mr. Sargent's ear about that because I've been in contact with him. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Any other questions about commercial properties? We're very involved in commercial properties as well. We're very busy. We have 11 inspectors. Uh, I think there's well over 130,000 houses in the county now, so they're very, very busy. I just want to mention this because this is a significant project. There, there's been more interest in aging apartment complexes in the county over the last several years. And so our department, along with building inspections, undertook this inspection program for apartment buildings. We went out and inspected 177 apartment complexes, and uh, consisting of 33,000 apartments all, all, all over the county. Uh, you know, we looked for parking lot deficiencies, trash and debris, and operable vehicles. Building looked for things like stairways, siding and trim missing, and siding and trim in disrepair. And in as much as we're focusing on this a lot, we actually rearranged and reorganized our workforce a little bit. I have two inspectors now that work just on apartment complexes and aging hotels. So this is one of the focuses. The county wants to maintain these older types of businesses, whether it be apartments or hotels, and, and we're very, very busy on that. And that's all I have, Mr. Thornton. I'll be glad to answer some more questions if anybody has any. Yes, sir. My name is Jones. I live in the Cedar Run subdivision uh, just off Cedar Fork. Um, just off Cedar Fork. We are experiencing the uh, cable uh, inlay from Verizon. Mm -hmm. And it's quite invasive in the community. Our homeowners association bless their hearts, did not do very much in terms of letting the homeowners know that this was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And of course, Verizon is coming on the property, they got an easement, they have a right to do that, but we got no heads up about it. And I'm wondering, who has the real responsibility to let the homeowner know that something this big is happening in the community? Boy, that, that's really a great question. And we do hear things about right-of-way work now and then from people. I, I think it should be Verizon. They probably should have uh, sent mailers out to everyone in the neighborhood just to let them know. You've got these big utilities, and they're not necessarily used to being customer friendly in, in these scenarios. Um, and it, it's just something that, that, that happens. But if you're asking me, I think it should have probably been Verizon. And or they could have worked with your HOA to see that there's a community meeting at which, which questions can be asked and answered, and that kind of thing. Yeah, nothing like that happened. Thank you for your oh, Okay, yep. and I'll be here afterwards if anybody wants to approach me with, with questions or anything, just, just do so. I don't have to go yet. Uh, I want to respond to uh, Dr. Jones' question. Uh, as you know, we've been exchanging some emails, and you uh, let us know about that. Um, I think, as Paul said, there are some utilities that they are still working on uh, customer service. So we're gonna see, we being the county, we're gonna see that that's done in a different way. Because that's, that's, you know, we do have a slogan called the Henrico Way. And that is, you know, having certain respectability towards the citizens and, and their uh, experiences and all of that. So we're gonna be working with that utilities and others. So what's important about what he said is he, he let us know about it. You, you'd be surprised that sometimes the county may not know about something unless you complain to us. And uh, that also helps keep the neighborhoods viable, very important. So Dr. Jones, we, we appreciate that. Now, you don't get to see Mr. Johnson every day. Any other questions 
about violations in your community. Uh, Paul, you want to give them the hot number to call? Is that still a hot number? Yes. You can call 501-4757. Wait a minute. Say that again. 501-4757. <laughs> 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 All, right. All right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> That hot number, that hot number is very important. So let's make sure that uh, we have that. Okay. So call that hot number. Okay, call that number. And of course, some of you also know to call me. Okay. Um, sometimes as citizens, uh, we go walking like I've started to do now, uh, trying to keep the body in shape and all that. And, you know, people have their different methods of trying to keep in shape and all that. Uh, but sometimes I get calls from the community and citizens are a little alarmed. And they're alarmed about sometimes dogs. And uh, especially maybe dogs that not on leashes and what have you. And um, actually, the county has a law about that. And so we want to bring up Officer Alexandra Dickinson, who is with the Animal Protection uh, for Henrico County, to kind of give you a wherewithal and the things that you need to know about that. Thank you, sir. Hi, everybody. My name is Alex Dickinson. I'm a police officer with the Henrico Police, but the Animal Protection Unit. Um, so I respond to all of the animal-related questions and calls that come into the county. Um, they asked me to speak specifically to the noise ordinance and like the control ordinances that we have here in the county. Um, Henrico County is a little different in that we have a control ordinance for dogs, um, which means that dogs don't have to be on leashes per se. Um, they have to be under the owner's control, um, under either on the owner's property or under the owner's direct control. That can be vocal control or a leash, but on, under control. Um, so they are not allowed to run loose. Uh, we, get a, we respond to a lot of calls for dogs running loose um, that we will investigate. And if we can talk to an owner on that matter, we certainly do. Um, in Henrico County, the noise ordinance pertaining to dogs um, is the Dog has to bark once a minute for a consecutive 10 minutes to be in violation. <laughs> once a minute? Yes. Yes. It is once a minute for a consecutive 10 minutes. Um, so generally when a dog barks, they're barking for a reason. They're barking because they see a squirrel or somebody's walking by their house. Um, it's when it becomes excessive that, you know, it becomes a nuisance to the neighborhood. Um, dogs that are barking, a lot of times it's because of their separation anxiety. Um, they're either outside by themselves and have nothing better to do, or they're, you know, they're missing their human. Um, so once a minute for consecutive 10 minutes is when it's in violation um, of the noise ordinance, and we, we do respond out, um, and we have to sit there and listen to them for 10 minutes straight before we can... <laughs> We'll go and talk to an owner. We try, we try to make contact with the owner, and we've got a couple different ways that we can go about doing that, whether or not they're home or not. Um, so we try and talk to the owner and just let them know, especially if they're not home, you know, hey, your dog is barking a lot when, they're, when you're gone. It's probably got some separation anxiety. Um, you know, you might want to look into some, some training or some options to help them with that. Okay, can I ask you a question? Um, why is there a concern about dog barking when people are allowed to keep noise up until 11 o'clock? I don't understand that. Is that what, what, that's the problem here. That is a that's better question for him. He'll be up next. Um, I don't care about the dog barking, but uh, the noise ordinance on, on dogs is 24-7. Um, so that is any time during the day. It doesn't have to be past 11 o'clock. So. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I don't know if these people read them or what, but they break they bark all the time. Okay. Back in the day, 4 o'clock in the morning, these mm -hmm. guys are barking. Okay. Now, you said one minute? Once a minute. <laughs> for 10 minutes straight. If we're going every hour or something, you know? Certainly, I mean, certainly give us a call um, and we can come out. Our, our, our unit works 
from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. Um, anything outside of those hours is going to go to a patrol unit. If they can't handle it or they think that it needs to be directed to us, they'll give it to us and we'll then respond out in the morning when we, when we, when we mark on. Um, so if it's at 4 in the morning, you can still call 501-5000. That's the police non-emergency number. Well, these dogs, I mean, they're awesome. Yeah. And uh, we walk in after the mm -hmm. with seniors. And these dogs are out here barking when you walk up. Okay. But they're not doing it for 10 minutes. Even if it's not 10 minutes, I'm happy to talk to, I mean, I'll, everybody in our unit, we'll talk to an owner and say, hey, you know, we've gotten a complaint that the dogs are barking. I don't know that for sure that it's, you know, in violation, but it's at least bothering the neighbors. Um, can you try and remedy that? I mean, we, we, work, we work with a lot of people, um, you know, even just minor noise. Yeah, but see, the things we see, like, uh, I don't think the dog gets fed until whoever owns the dogs come in. They might come in twice a week to feed these dogs. Got two of one chains. Okay. And the, the, the people own that. Mm -hmm. How do you see them out there in the yard? Okay. Uh, that might be something more in the realm of we can do what we call a welfare check on the dogs, um, just to make sure that they're being fed properly, water, watered properly, they've got the proper shelter situation going on, um, and they're being just overall generally cared for properly. Um, so that's something we could certainly check. Um, I don't know specifically where you're at. You know, if, if we. Well, we did call them on four one time. Okay. We haven't heard back. I don't know. <laughs> when, when, when did you call them? Last week. Last week. Last week. Okay. And you never heard back from them? No. Okay. One, um, one of our neighbors gave us a schedule on how often they feed these dogs. Okay. <laughs> I can guarantee an officer went out there. Uh, because we do respond to every call that we get within that 24-hour period. Um, whether or not, I, I can't speak to, you know, it wasn't, I wasn't the one who got the call because I work primarily in the West End, but, um, you know, when I, every call that I get, I respond out to, and it kind of depends on whether dispatch asked if you wanted to be talked to afterwards. Um, some, some people do, some people want to remain anonymous, and they, our calls will specifically say whether or not the complainant wants to be spoken with afterwards. Okay. I'm for him to come by the box. Okay. Because I'm going to stay right in the back of me. Okay. I mean, like the uh, community maintenance gentleman was speaking earlier, um, you know, we, we respond to every complaint, but we don't, we're not quite as proactive. There's usually two or three of us working at any given point, so we get a lot of calls throughout the county. Um, so if you call, we will come. <laughs> What's your number? Sorry? What is your number? It is 804. 501-5000. That's the general police non-emergency number, but it reaches all of us. Were there any other questions? 501-5000. 5000. Okay, I did have something else to say. Yes. Because the kind of rock last night on the news there were two rock balls attacking a child. And, uh, I think what bothered me about the whole story was, the news reporter's comment was, and here is um, a reason why you should get your animals, uh, keep their records up to date. And it was like, no concern for the child, just for the dogs, because their vaccinations and all were up to date. Right. I thought it was just so insensitive. I mean, it was just, like I said, you may not have anything to do with that, but that's a comment. But I know for myself, when I did have a dog, and my dog was attacked, I mean, it... I, I, know, I know that there, there is an open case, case on that. I, I can't speak too much yeah. to the case because I don't know all the details. Um, and it is an open investigation at this point. Um, anytime that we receive a report of a dog bite, we will go out to the residence where the dog lives. And this is regardless of how s severe the bite was. I believe in that case it was very severe. Um, but even if it's just a small nip or a scratch, um, we get a report of a bite or a scratch, we go out and we verify the rabies vaccination and county dog licenses on the dog. Um, we still see rabies in the wild animal population occasionally. It's pretty rare. I don't think we've had any cases yet this year. Um, but we do, get, we do still see it in the wild animal population and it is a virus that is transmissible to all mammals. 
Um, so that is the one, that's one of our big concerns. Um, certainly, obviously, the care of the person who was bitten. Um, there's no reflection on you. I was just saying how insensitive it was. I can't speak to what the yeah. news reports. Exactly. But the so. reporting of it, it was just, it just sounded so insensitive. It was like, it was more concerned about, well, the dogs are vaccinated. Like, this kid has been all out of me. You know? it's, it's terrible. Yeah. But as I say, when my dog was attacked, I got nothing through the courts. I got nothing. Except a vet bill. That was it. Hi. Um, every morning we walk at the track here, mm -hmm. and there are two signs up pro prohibiting pets to be on the track. Okay. However, you do have people that will walk the pets on the track, and on top of that, the pets will use the restroom in the middle with a grassy part. And as you know, and on the track, and as you know, you have kids that play in that grass. And then you have people who walk on that track daily. And I'm talking pit bulls or whatever, any type of dogs, all types of dogs. But the signs are so small that says no pets allowed. The sign is about this big. <laughs> and, and then the location of the sign, one is by the bathroom and one is on the fence. But Something needs to be done about it because it's getting, it's getting worse. And like you said, she said, people be using, I mean, dogs be using the restroom on the track. And from what we was told, that they're supposed to be on the outskirts of the track. You know what I'm talking about? Is this in a county park? No, right here. Right here. Right, right here. Okay. Okay, the media track itself is supposed to be for the people to walk on. Right. The outside is supposed to be when you walk your animals. Okay. But they have to, uh, those uh, dog things. Pick up the dog this way, right? right? On the outskirts, but people are already knowing the signs. We have a lot of problems there, especially late, it gets worse. And, and the sign says no bicycles, no motorized vehicles, no, no pets, but the sign is so small, a lot of people ignore the sign. Okay. And, but we, we have some situations that get kind of bad out there one time, because like you said, you have pit bulls. We all love dogs, but it's early for everything. You know, you got dog parks too, you got you know, a lot of things, but not on the track where people walk. Right. I think that falls more under like parks and recs jurisdiction. Um, okay, we'll, we'll let them know. Um, that, that falls under parks and recs jurisdiction. Um, we actually can't enforce park rules. They're not the same as like your county ordinances. Um, so we'll let them know um, that we've got that and going on. Who's that supposed to talk to? Oh, oh. okay. okay. Oh. okay. Were there any other questions? Well, the sign, and another thing to take back to part of the mm -hmm. there are no signs to be placed before you uh, talk to the track. Because they're yeah. on the bleacher and okay. on the shelves on the bathroom. A lot of people don't see the signs until they walk in on the track. So they need to be before you enter right. on like the track. Like right on the entrance, yeah. And, and it needs to be bigger. bigger. It's bigger. It's bigger. It's bigger. Right. The small writing. Okay. Yeah. He's writing it down. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, if there was nothing else, I will turn it over to our shelter manager, Pamela, and let her talk to you about animals in the shelter. Hey, good evening, everybody. I am 12 weeks into this position at the animal shelter, so take it easy on me, okay? <laughs> We um, take care of the pets that uh, APO Dickinson brings in and all the other animal protection officers that work the county of Henrico. We generally have dogs and cats. Most of our pets that come in, come in as strays. We sometimes have guinea pigs, rabbits. Um, haven't had a chinchilla yet, but I expect to see one sooner or later. We have had a monitor. We have all kinds of pets and the pets that come into the shelter, I'm responsible to make sure they are cared for while they're in our, while they're in our care. They all come in and stay for a defined period of time, depending on whether they have any identification on them, whether they have a microchip, a collar, whatever the case may be. We make all attempts possible to try to reach an owner so that they can be reunited with their pet. Sometimes when that doesn't happen, once that stray period is over, the pet is placed up for adoption. Pets that are adopted from our shelter will be spayed or neutered, given a rabies vaccine, distemper vaccine, and microchipped if they're not already before they go to their new home. And so that's the fun part of our job, getting to send the pets 
to, to new homes. So that's, that's kind of the gist of the shelter. Any, at any given period of time in the 12 weeks I've been there, we're caring for anywhere between 61 up to 120 pets at a time. So it can vary wildly, the number of pets. We, majority of the pets we have are dogs. So um, I'll field any questions anyone has about the shelter. Nobody? Come on. Someone throw me a question. <laughs> she says for the camera, but I really didn't need a mic. I had a question. Um, this month, is this supposed to have a, like a vaccination clinic for, um, for the dogs this month? So there is a rabies vaccine. Right, yeah. Uh -huh. Yes, ma'am. This weekend at the Parham Road location, the government center from 9 to 12, it's $10 cash, vaccinate dogs and cats. And the county puts on, it's my understanding, four a year. Through, and the dates are published on the Henrico uh, County website as well. But you can always call the shelter and ask when the next one's coming up, and we'll tell you where the next one is and which location. Anybody else? I love questions, y'all. <laughs> no? Okay. Well, now... They had two people out there trying to get uh, citizens to adopt, a tr adopt or uh, make donations towards the S SPCA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, the girl gave me a website to go to to make individual donations instead of making a donation every month, which would have cost a little bit more than I'm willing to spend right now. Do you have that information? No, I'm sorry. Um, that is a different organization. Oh, okay. Than the county shelter. Uh, the county shelter is completely funded by the county. Uh, we do not ask for monetary donations. You can, however, donate items such as dog food, can, dry, bedding, um, anything that collars, leashes that would be associated with pet care. We do accept those donations all the time. And if you gave me the um, address, I didn't hear it our address. <laughs> I don't know it by heart. I know it's 1-1. One, one. It is 10421 Woodman Road in Glen Allen. I don't know the zip code. <laughs> it's located by Woodman Road and Mountain Road, close to that intersection just off of 295. Yep, that's a picture of the shelter right there. Yes, um, does Franco have a TMR program? The county itself, the animal shelter, does not. However, there are several nonprofit organizations within the county of Henrico, City of Richmond, and surrounding areas that will offer to assist with trap, neuter, return programs. And if you, I can give you my email address. I'd be happy to share some of those with you if you, you know, it's B R I one two four at Herico dot US. Yeah, of course. Any other questions? Yes. Does the county provide any provisions for wild animals <coughs> like the the uh, groundhogs and Oh my God. So beavers. That's more, uh, officer beavers. Um, yeah. Yeah. I do know that we've got a lot of groundhog calls lately. As far as wildlife goes, um, we respond to some wildlife calls. A majority of what we we deal with is sick or injured animals, um, or if you have like road kills, so dead animals on the road. Um, most of the healthy wildlife, we try to leave it be. Now, there are certain things that you can do to kind of mitigate it, um, certain like products you can buy. Um, and if you trap something in your own personal live trap, we will come and remove it for you. But other than that, we don't do a lot with healthy wildlife. It, we have a lot of it in the county, so. Yes, sir. What we could do, you call, they'll tell you, get the dog from the cage, I'll call and see my dog. There, the county won't. 
I know that there are companies out there that will provide a cage. Um, it's, it's a standard have a heart trap or a live trap. Um, and I know you can get those fairly inexpensive from a lot of places. Yeah. The county will not provide a trap for you to put out. Um, I know that there's private companies out there that will. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can't speak to prices on what those private companies do. Like I said, we don't set traps for wildlife, but if you have a trap and you do set it and you catch something, we will come out and remove it for you. Do you do anything with the wildlife, like beavers that are taking trees down in neighborhoods? Do you do anything with that? I don't know of any instances where we have. I think that would be something where you'd have to call like wildlife resources with the state. Um, they would be that would be more their realm. The trees coming down our neighborhood because of beavers. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. One across the street the other morning. If you go to wildlife resources, I believe it's .gov, um, they have a wildlife, a wildlife conflict hotline, um, and I believe that operates like Monday through Friday. You can give them a call. I'll pass um, it along they, because the homeowners association said that no one was willing to do anything about it because, you know, but now the other day one fell. So I know. Yeah, I know there's some animals that we can't even do things with, beaver being one of them. They're a fur bear. Um, beaver and fox we cannot trap uh, because there is a specific trapping season for them, just like there's a hunting season. Um, so that has to go to, uh, it used to be game in, inland fisheries. Now it's wildlife resources, um, and that's through the state. Thank you so very much for that information. Um, some of you, as I mentioned a few moments ago, saw some information about uh, used cars. And so I want to make sure that you know what that was all about and for you to know the specifics of what it is that the county is doing about that. And also, it, it, it came to my attention that some of you, you know, with COVID, and we have not had any in-person meetings like this, that uh, the young lady I'm gonna bring up here, you, never, you haven't met her. She's the new finance director. So let's give me, let me get, give you a little background as she is getting ready to come up here. Her name is Ms. Sheila Minor. Um, Sheila Minor recently uh, joined Henrico County team in December 2021. Um, she comes to Henrico from the city of Colonia Heights, where she has served as finance director since June 2017. Prior to her service with Colonia Heights, Ms. Minor worked as director of finance for Prince George County and as a budget and revenue analyst for Chesterfield County. She earned a Bachelor of Science degree and a Master of Public Administration from Virginia Tech. Uh, she is a certified public accountant, a certified public finance officer, and a certified government finance manager. So we're happy this evening to have Ms. Manor to give you some information on cars, used cars, because normally, as you know, when we buy that car, pull it off, coming off the car lot, that car depreciates. But in some of your tax things, you've been notice an oddity, totally different, that used cars, the value has gone up, up, and up. And this uh, is an, an anomaly. And we have not seen that, uh, this, this person, had never seen it before. So Ms. Martin is going to tell us what the county has done about that and any other questions that you may have, okay? Thank you. And good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for the chance to be here and for that introduction. So when they told me I was going to do my first constituent meeting, I said, well, what do I need to bring? And they said, well, brochures. So there are a few of these back here, slides, 
that they didn't mention food or handouts. So next time I will be better prepared, and I apologize in advance. But as uh, Mr. Thornton mentioned, we, um, I had a conversation before the meeting, and you have heard a lot about inflation lately. And there are two areas where we've had some pretty unprecedented inflation impacting constituents of the county. And those areas are real estate and your vehicles. Um, with real estate, just real briefly, we, that was what we focused on last winter because we saw what the real estate market was doing. And there was an initiative the county did called the 2 plus 2 plan that you've heard something about. And that was reducing the tax rate by 2 cents to 85 cents per hundred. We used to be at 87 cents per hundred. And the other was the credit program. And that was really new to not only Henrico County, but the, the state of Virginia. And that is when the county sent back the checks that many of you probably received with a two cent rebate on your real estate taxes or you saw that two cent credit applied on your real estate tax bill. But there was one that one trend that we weren't necessarily as prepared for and that's what's happened in the used vehicle market. This is a graph from JD Power. This is a the 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 national entity that provides car valuations to print to um, Henrico and a number of other localities. And you can, this is 20 years, actually 22 years, I believe, because it starts in January of 2000. You see that values really kind of just up and down and around and just kind of hovered there until you got to December of 2020. And you see it bumped up there December 2020, and then between December 20 and December 21, it just went through the roof. And that year-over-year -year percentage, the, the National Used Car Price Index increased 40.8% between December of 20 and December of 21. A couple things happening to just drive that market up, and that was the supply chain for parts of new vehicles and just demand, that the demand was not keeping up. And so if the folks weren't able to get new cars, they started asking for used cars. And that's what made those values go so high. So the county sent out bills that arrived in mailboxes on Friday the 29th of April. And our phones lit up and our email boxes lit up because we were expecting a 15%. That's what we budgeted for. And what we came back with was 36% increase overall on average. Now, that didn't impact every vehicle. It impacted some vehicles, few vehicles continue to depreciate. It didn't impact our business personal property, which is taxed at the same rate. It didn't impact our airplanes, boats, trailers, all of those other pieces of personal property that get valued. But certainly our used vehicle market is one of our bigger ones. So by Tuesday, bills came out on Friday. By Tuesday, the county manager is in the office with us saying, what can we do? What can we do? We need to do something. What can we do? So out of those meetings came the two initiatives I'm going to tell you about today that we announced on Friday, the May 6th, the first of which is to give an extension on the due date for those bills on personal property. They were a surprise. We want to make sure folks have more time to pay. So the due date on those bills reads as June 6, 2022. But that date has been extended. You will have until August the 5th, 60 more days, to pay those bills with no penalty, no interest. Okay. So that was one thing we could do immediately. This is not the first time we've extended the, the due date in personal property. Tw two years ago with COVID, we had an extension as well to give everyone more time to pay. So that applies to all the personal property taxes. It applies to our business community as well, just because they were part of that batching process and administratively we've got to put them in with it. So. The real estate bills still remain due on June 6th. If you have paid off your house and you're receiving those, those real estate bills directly, those will still be due the 6th of June, but those personal property bills are going to be due August 5th. The second piece that we did is a little bit more unique and a little more complicated, and that is that we are providing a credit for personal property similar to what we did for real estate, but not in the same way. There's not going to be checks this time. What we are doing is we are calculating a credit equal to 52 cents on your assessed value. So 
instead of being $3.50 as your tax, it's really equivalent to $2.98. That credit is going to be applied to automobiles, trucks, and motorcycles, those categories that are impacted by those national price increases you saw going straight up like that. Um, the, that credit's going to be on your second half billing that you receive in about the October time frame that will be due December 5th. So for the first time ever, if you have been in the county the whole year with a whole with, with the same vehicles, you're going to see one bill at one amount in June, due June, and a bill at a much reduced amount in December because we're going to be applying that full year credit to the second half bill. Um, this isn't going to apply to some folks who have exempt properties. If you, your vehicle is valued at less than $1,000, you're not paying personal property tax because it's all considered part of the state's personal property tax relief. If you are a, a volunteer in a rescue squad or a volunteer firefighter, we also have special rates for disabled and handicapped individuals that are, are very low. Those aren't going to receive the credit, but those who are paying at the $3.50 rate on used vehicles and new vehicles are going to see that 52 cent credit applied to their second half bill. Moving vehicles into and out of the county, we're accounting for that as well. The credit will be prorated to the amount of time that, that folks are in the county. So we're trying to make it as equitable and as widespread as possible so that we provide that relief evenly to everyone who owns a vehicle. So I have an example of how that is calculated. I love math. Not everybody loves math. I don't understand it. But let me just tell you that it, you see that this is a vehicle assessed in that top right corner at $36,700. All you need to think about is that the credit that's going to be applied on a vehicle like that is $190.84. So that bill, if we had done nothing with the credit, would have been a thousand dollars, thousand and four dollars and fifty cents for those who like to be exact like me. With the credit, that bill for the whole year, we're talking whole year here, we're not splitting the halves, and for the whole year that bill goes to eight hundred and thirteen dollars and sixty six cents with that credit. So that's kind of to tell you that we are trying to apply it for the whole year prospectively, but you're getting all of the benefit in the second half because once those first bills went out there wasn't really any way for any means for us to put that out there further this the, the ability to do this is something really new the general assembly that met back in the february time frame approved the bill that allowed us to do this for personal property but it doesn't even take effect until july 1st so even if we had been able to do something for the the first part of the, the year we couldn't legally do it until after that july 1st time frame so we're using authority that we're we're planning to use authority. We haven't even been enacted or granted yet. So this is a little bit of creativity to make sure that we were able to provide relief to our citizens because of that used vehicle market that kind of took everybody by, by shock. So I wanted to be brief because I know you have had a lot of questions and I'd be happy to answer any that you might have about this initiative. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, you said we be uh, check, right? It will not be a check. It will be applied to the bill. But what about the people that uh, the first half you paid the whole year? That is a great question, and I'm glad you asked that because I do have an answer to that. So if you've already paid for the whole year, and several residents have done that, when we apply that a credit in October time frame, it, what it's going to do is it's going to say your account has been overpaid. And when it does, then it will generate a check to those folks who have already paid in advance because it, the system treats it as if you had overpaid by accident and it issues you a refund check. So yes, there will be checks in those cases where folks have already paid 100% of their bill. Excellent question. Thank you for bringing that up. I also, if you want to know kind of where that, how much that credit might be for a value that's closer to your car and you like math. I have some handouts that show you at different assessed valuations how much that credit calculates out to be. And I'll have those after I'm done the handout if you want to just discuss. Or you know what, I'm, I'm more than happy to pull out a calculator and we'll see exactly what, what you're getting back. So happy to do that. Other questions? In the very back, you're going to have to be, <laughs> be loud. <laughs> people 
were um, getting credit on their personal property tax, like you said. Did you say people on disability? Or did you say firefighters, volunteer? So the, the county has special rates for certain owners, and those are folks who are disabled veterans, who are, have handicapped vehicles. And you'll know who you are because you are not paying at a $3.50 rate on your bill. You're paying it more at a dollar rate or even a one cent rate in some cases. So those won't have a 52 cent credit applied because they're not really impacted by the full value of the tax, if that makes sense. If you are paying at a $3.50 rate, you are going to see a credit on your bill if you have a vehicle such as a car, truck, motorcycle, van, anything that would be priced by that guide and have those kinds of increases, okay? I hope that answers your question. Okay. Other questions? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And or real <laughs> Am I talking that low? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, I know we're talking about the um, real estate and or car taxes because that's a big deal right now. Mm -hmm. um, and do you have anything to do with the rezoning permits, things of that nature? That I do not. Okay. I mean, our office collects them in our treasury department, but that's more of the planning department than, than finance. So I, I would not know enough to be helpful on that. Okay. Sorry. Uh, I'll talk. Okay. <laughs> Other questions? Thank you folks so much. I appreciate it. This was my first constituent meeting. I got to say, I am so impressed by all of the, the folks who are here tonight. Thank you for being involved in your community and reaching out. It's, it means a lot to us as a staff to know that there are people interested in what we do. So thank you. And uh, those of you who got the little green cards with uh, the notice, we want to make sure that we don't leave here and you didn't get all the information. And so at this time, Officer Terrell Parker is going to come up and talk about noise and what the police can do about that, okay? Thank you, Mr. Thornton. All right, first, let me do the caveat. I didn't make the noise ordinance, okay? Because I can see there's going to be a lot of questions about it. All right, but before we get started, um, a couple things I want to bring up. Um, when I came tonight, uh, well, first, let me say this. I'm Officer T.L. Parker with Rico County Division of Police Community Operations. I'm one of three officers for this Fairfield District. It's going to be Officer Shane Hearn, who's a new officer, and as, as well as Officer um, Renato Arjona. They couldn't be here tonight, but y'all will probably meet them at future meetings. So, and hopefully y'all will be here to continue that. So I want to start off by saying I brought to the back for some of you guys, about 20 community resource guides. This is actually available online, but we do get a lot of questions about things. So I'm gonna tell you what's in this community resource guide real briefly. It does deal with noise ordinance. It deals with grass and weeds, road control, trash and debris, abandoned and operable vehicles, trailers, trucks, pets, dogs running at large and vicious dogs, dog licensees, vaccinations. I have about 20 in the back. Please pick this up. Um, this will also help you guys with some of the questions y'all may have or things you may have thought about um, tonight that you weren't able to ask, okay? And they're in the back, so I brought about 20. If not, there's on the website. We can go over that as well, but you can definitely reach them. All right? And I want to thank y'all for coming as well. The turnout seems to be pretty decent. Um, I do want to start off with a few things. Um, one is about the dogs. I don't want to get the APO back involved, but... Uh, I know there's a lot of concerns with dogs barking, and yes, it can be at times frustrating, but I will also tell you that dogs also provide a warning, okay? They also provide a deterrent, okay? So these are things that are also very important, because I will tell you this, we've chased many a person at night, and listening to that dog bark down that road, we can figure out exactly where they're going. And when that person comes outside and says, my dog is barking, and they don't usually bark at night, it leads right to that suspect or that subject. So just be mindful of that as well. And speaking of dogs, 
Now, don't be ashamed to go talk to your neighbor. Don't be afraid to talk to your neighbor and knock on the door just to see if there's a concern with the dog. A lot of these things, when we go on calls for service, the people will call the police. First thing they would say is, I mean, they could have just talked to me. They could just knocked on the door. They didn't have to call you. We're great as a resource. We want to come and we will come. But could you imagine just not speaking to your neighbor and then the police is the first person they speak with? I mean, you could probably just talk to them on your own, how that puts the frustration with everybody. So just kind of, you know, if you can. I mean, neighbors are different these days, but at least try to talk to them. If you can't, you just can't. I do understand, okay? So let's just be, uh, keep that in mind. So, moving into the noise violations, there's going to be some questions. I hope I can answer them, but I do want to tell you all this. It is summer, okay? So let's be mindful of everything was closed in like roughly 20, 2021. So you know you're going to have a lot of events coming up. Um, graduations, parties, cookouts, birthday parties, baby showers, bridal showers, you know, one-year-old birthday parties as well, because that seems to be the thing as well. So let's just be mindful that these events are occurring. And at one point or some point, either you have a graduate or you will be having a graduate or you may be having a one-year-old or you might be a grandparent. So let's just be mindful of that as well when we uh, so start to ask you. Um, that if people are having parties, that we need to accept the noise level and let them do their thing. Because I'm not understanding. No, ma'am, I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying let's just be mindful because we all can talk and have events. Well, two blocks away, noise is ridiculous. We'll address that as well. But since we're getting into the ridiculous of the noise, Henrico County does have quiet times. So if y'all ready to start writing, I'm gonna give y'all some information. Okay, are y'all ready? These quiet times are gonna be from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. So if a neighbor is creating a bothersome noise outside of those times, it may be considered a violation of the Norris ordinance. Parts of this code that we, go, that we address, you know, it may not fit every category, but that is the time frame from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m., all right? So I'm gonna give you all a question. We talked about the dogs already, so we need to go over that. But what do I do if my neighbor's having a very loud party at midnight, okay? Your answer would be the quiet times are from 11 Y'all got it, okay? If a, if a neighbor's creating a bother to noise during those times, it could be a noise violation, specifically parties with 10 or more people where the sound is audible within the dwelling, such as an apartment building, even in the backyard, and if it's also 100 feet in violation. So that answers your question. So if it's two blocks over and it measures to be 100 feet, then we can address that if you're making that call and making that call for service. Can I, can I, okay, because this is the only reason I came tonight for this noise thing. So, um, so are you saying that if they make the noise prior to the 11 o'clock hour and it's that distance, that that's okay? They're in violation or if they're making the noise regardless? The noise orders in effect from 11 p.m. So anything prior to that, it's nothing you all can do about it? At 10.59, we would not respond to that. Okay, so we ought to take this in our own hands when the, when the neighbors are so close. Because my neighbor and I, I, I've been letters to my neighbors, I've called the police, and they said we can't do it until 11 o'clock. And my neighbors, they, they don't understand that I play music in my house, but I play for myself. I don't play for the entire neighborhood, and it's just ridiculous. You've got people who are singing who can't sleep, I can't sleep, I can't study. I can't do anything because my neighbors are so noisy. And it's nothing the police can do. So I do go over there myself sometimes. And sometimes it may not be the smartest idea, but I do. Well, if they are playing loud music, ladies and gentlemen, if y'all didn't hear a question, I mean, do you take things in your own hands? I mean, let's just think about what we're saying and what we're doing here, okay? Again, please be polite with your neighbors, all right? Please call us. We're available 24 seven. We'll be glad to come and speak with the neighbor. But what we're saying is, on a legal aspect for us, us we have, we cannot enforce this law until 11 to 7. How would you get that to change? How would you get that, that ordinance to change to a different hour? Because 11 o'clock is pretty late when people got kids and people trying to sleep. And my neighbors, he has like 10, 12 cars out there partying all the time and they don't care. You know, and then when you go over there and say something, then they want to, you know, if you think it's a little hairy and scary. 
Well, I'm sure we can, you can always start a petition within your neighborhood as well. Um, you can also, um, if you have an HOA, an active HOA or neighborhood watch group, these things do come up as well, and we can bring them to the attention of uh, the Board of Supervisors or even the County Manager. Um, but we also have been, we look at the calls for service as far as these. We know there are time frames, so these are things that we do attempt to address. Um, case by case, of course. And generally, neighbors do or will turn the music down. So we haven't had too many issues. No, okay, not in my neighborhood. Maybe somebody else's neighborhood, but in mine, they don't. They don't. <laughs> <laughs> so do, say, what you say? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but they don't turn it down. They just say, well, I'm not going to Well, welcome back, Parker. Thank you. So one of the things that I did here was concerning vehicles. And with the vehicles, um, I know that, well, I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that the ordinance is different for vehicles. Yes. So, and that is a major concern with um, vehicles being parked at others' homes, like your neighbors, and it's extremely loud with oh. some of the vehicles, the homes are shaking with some of us, we work at home. Oh. So if I'm on a meeting, you know, I have to put a disclaimer out there to say, hey, you know, did you hear like the Mustang going by or the ATV going by? I think it's ATV, but, um, but that's one of the major concerns. Yes, ma'am. Um, we do address the loud mufflers um, as traffic violations. We do address those. But with that being said, that's a good question. So there was a question that came up. What can I do about a car that drives down the street with loud music? Okay, so that's pretty much what your question is. All right. So the county code does prohibit amplified sounds from vehicles audible from 50 feet away in any direction. 50 feet away in any direction. And that's any time of day, any time of night. So we'll address it at that point. Anything from a vehicle. Okay. And with that being said, we have received, well, I recently received a complaint about loud music in car wash bays. So if you're, like, say someone's washing their vehicle or vacuuming their car at a gas station, let's say, let's say the Shell gas station, that we will respond to that if it's emanating from 50 feet. But the first thing is we need to know about it. So with that being said, we encourage you to call the police. Mr. Um, Thornton's office does get a lot of requests. He does get a lot of emails. He does get a lot of calls. Generally, these calls do, believe it or not, they do filter down to me. So the first thing that I do is look up the call for service because we got to have some research. I got to have something to go off when I approach these businesses, such as the Shell gas station, as an example. And if I have no call for service, it's kind of hard for me to do as much follow-up because that business will state, I never received any complaints, but we will address it. And at the same time, I will follow up with you, but we do encourage you to call. You know, we do not tell who calls. We never give them the information, but we do want to address it. And has that happened? Of course it has. But these are things that we will address and we do address. So 50 feet from vehicles in any direction, okay? Um, I guess my concern is that there's so much um, care about people driving their cars and they Have you ever, and maybe the officer can help you, have, uh, I'd like to ask the officer, if she was to call for you to come out and listen to the noise prior to that, would you go? And I would like to ask her, have she called anyone to go, wait a minute, hold it, to, to have you call anyone to come out and really check the noise? Because you sound like you, I don't know what's going on, but it sounds like there's a lot of noise if it's like that. Thank you. What? Well, this is what happens. If we get a call for service, and some officers do have what we call a noise meter, you know, we will stand on your premises or thereabout and see if it's actually emanating. Sound does echo, and we will attempt to address it. But again, y'all have to be mindful. The noise ordinance is for us to do violations from 11 to 7. 
is from 11 to 7. Hold one second. Yes, ma'am. I'm just trying to help, but the reason why I mention the vehicles is because we've had our own experience with vehicles. They may not be temporary. They may be at someone's house and they are visiting and they're just having fun and playing music sitting there for hours. So there have been times where I've called the police and when I go back and I look into the system to see how it was recorded, it was recorded as just, I guess, regular noise. Instead of me looking outside and telling the um, 911 operator or dispatch that it's a vehicle because it's different. So you have to be clear when you call about what the issue is. So if, it, if you look outside and you see that it's a vehicle parked at somebody's house, then you need to say, this is, there is a vehicle there, it's really loud and blah, 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 because that, that changes, that changes your issue. So 11 and 7 is, is one thing, but it's a vehicle that's any time of the day, right? Right, Parker? Yes, any time of day, 50 feet. So we can also attempt to address some th issues as a nuisance if we can. But again, these things do come in with call for service. Um, you also have to have, you know, you know, you need to have an explanation, explain some of these things, because, again, we are governed by the law. Here's the reality of it, ladies and gentlemen. The law is black and white, okay? It's a gray area that we like to operate in, but the law is black and white. I can't operate in that gray area, okay? So understand, the gray area, yes, I'm sure that that music is a nuisance, nine, 10, three, four, five hours a day, but far as the law, 11 to seven, that's how it's gonna work. That's how it works with us. Okay, we have to operate within that realm, but it's well. Just call us, and we'll we'll address it. Um, it's almost just like living in apartment buildings. Um, we get complaints from apartment buildings. Um, young kids run around all day, jumping up and down on the floor. We hear people do call the police. You know, it is a it is an issue. Um, it is, it does cause a nuisance, but we can address the apartment building a little bit differently. You know, cause we can go to the apartment building itself, the property manager, and we can address it with them with what the kids are doing. So those things we can control just a little bit different. There is a difference between renters and owners and what you can do. If it's noise emanating from a home and that home is maybe a rental property, then we can address the owner of the home. Cause that's pretty much how we can get things done. Cause maybe the renter's not complying. And that's fine. We can just go to the owner and we do those things as well. So it's just different avenues that we can touch. But again, we got to work within the confines of the law. Yes, sir. Okay. You talked about the noise ordinance from 11 to 7. 11 p.m. Does that include the racetrack too? That's a very, very good question. That's a very good question. Very good question. I know we got to go, but I'm, I'm going to address that as well. Um, but I do also want y'all to know that when y'all hear people such as peddlers and hawkers yelling, shouting, whistling, screaming, or crying for the purpose of attracting attention to a performance, show, sale, or display of merchandise between the hours of 11 and 7 on a public street or sidewalk or parking lot or any private owned street, it's also a violation. Okay, that's also a violation which we can address. Okay, the exception to that is if someone is yelling, screaming or crying and they're requesting emergency assistance okay i'll follow that unless they request emergency assistance so to answer your question with the racetrack um there are some exemptions okay <laughs> I wouldn't say it's money but here's the thing sound or noise which is necessary for the protection or preservation of property or health, safety, life or limb, or any person including sound or noise caused by restoration utility service or interruptions is also an exception. We get those calls about, you know, say you have a, a utility issue and they're drilling at night, two, three o'clock in the morning, one o'clock. That's an exception. They're trying to restore services back to someone. It could be water, it could be electricity. So that's an exception. Um, noise from maintenance construction on roads, radio sirens, horns, bells on the police, fire all those vehicles 
there are also an exceptions, okay? Because I hear that a lot. You know, the fire truck keeps me up all night with the fire station right there. It is an exception, okay? Parades, fireworks, displays, school-related activities, um, and any of such special events, those are also exceptions. Band performances, practices, athletic contests, other school-sponsored activities on public or private grounds, even in colleges, those are exceptions. All right. Religious, those are exceptions. We get complaints about as well with churches. Now, religious services, religious events, religious activities, or expressions included but not limited to music, singing bells, or chimes or organs, which are part of the service, you know, they're exceptions. However, we have addressed those events as well. Um, and generally, like the churches do apply because during the pandemic, a lot of churches was holding services outside. And they did have bands, and they did have live music. We did address those. It was really no problem. They just built stages so they can still provide the service to the community. But those are an exception. But again, they did comply, thinking about the community as well. Military activities, all of those are exceptions. So any type of amateur, professional, motorsports competition, competition-related events such as time trials, practices, provided for the competition is sanctioned by nationally recognized motorsports racing organization and complies with all applicable laws, regulations, and ordinance, including permitting terms and conditions, are all exceptions as well, to answer your question. And also, any type of political gatherings. I know that was gonna be quiet, boy, but, you know, <laughs> but, but any type of political gatherings. So I know it's a lot of concern about it. We do try to address it. We come out to all these calls for service. Um, but we do ask you to be patient. We do ask you to understand, and we do ask you to, uh, hey, you know, we put, we put handouts and manuals out there for y'all to know the law as well. Believe it or not, you know, everything's on the internet. Also got a brochure to the back. You can look up the stuff yourself as well to see what we can and can't do. And we'll definitely try to, you know, figure out something to bring communities together, but I do understand if it needs to be something, the legality is part of it, that we can work out as a community or as neighbors or as friends, then we just have to do it a different way. I have a question on this yes, one. Usually, when they have the racing day, it's usually, they usually stop around 10. Usually. Okay. Well, I'm just saying, why do the racetrack stop at 10? And we had the noise ordinance going from 11. I can't answer that. I can just tell you that they're an exception. So if that's what they do as far as a community, because we have a great um, relationship with, with RRR, then that's exactly what they do, and we appreciate them um, doing it for the residents, but they are an exception. I have another question. Please. Can I get off the um, subject for just a moment? Um, I went to a one of the movies that they have outside, um, I think it was that Deep Run. It was out past um, Innsbruck. And I have a question about the marijuana laws. We were there with all of our kids and our family. And there were people there that was um, smoking, which I thought that that was pretty bad for a family night and that going on. And also, like she mentioned, the um, cookouts and things that are going on. What is the um, law that says against that? I don't want to be have to sit in my backyard and um, smell what people are doing over in their yard. So can you tell me what is my, um, I guess, what I can do about that? Well, that's a good question regarding marijuana law, and it's still developing, believe it or not. But uh, marijuana is, it has been decriminalized, okay? You know, it has, it's the difference between illegal and decriminalized, okay? So what you can do is if it's in private property, in the confinements of their own home, or maybe in their backyard, it's not open to public view, even though we, I'm sure people do smoke in public view by looking over a fence, there's nothing we can do to enforce it. I mean, we smell it as well, but there's nothing we can do to enforce it. It's not a primary offense. Um, we smell it behind vehicles. You know, it's just not a primary offense. It doesn't give you enough probable cause to stop that vehicle unless I have another offense. So, as far as the law, it's decriminalized, but you know, you can in private. So, that outdoor movie that we went to, like, in my family, it was okay for them to do that? No, can 
cannot be used in a public place, ma'am. No, ma'am. But again, if you see these violations, ladies and gentlemen, we do encourage you to call the police. Um, and we can kind of address it on a case-by-case -case basis. If we see it in the county park and we see it in public, then we will address it. That's a good question. All right, any more questions? I have a question. Um, I heard a noise, a noise, um, noise. Um, a lot of noise in my neighborhood. There are young people who are on motorcycles mm -hmm. going up and down on Meadows Run. Okay. They go from one end to the other speeding, and they, you know, rear up their motor and go. Then they're going around the corner, and I keep hearing this, and it bothers me because of the fact not just because of the noise, but someone could be killed because yes, they're going so fast. So I keep saying, what should I do? Because I feel like by the time you get there, they're gone. So should I take video? Should I record it? Yes, ma'am. If you can record it, that's great. But it's a, two questions, so I'm going to answer both parts of it. One, if they're speeding, we do address speeding complaints. Um, we, have, we do it in community operations, and we also have a traffic safety unit that does that as well. So we can address those speeding complaints if they're speeding. Um, and they do make a lot of noise when they're speeding if they're operating those motorcycles. However, um, there is a violation for motorcycles if they're just sitting in a driveway and they just rev the engine real, real loud or real hard, just like uh, Dodge charges with the Hemis. You know, people do that quite a bit. Now, those are violations that we can address as well. So we can address the revving of a motorcycle's engine and a private driver if they're not leaving to go somewhere or they're just sitting in the driveway just revving it up. But if it's just merely starting and running and a lot of these Harley Davidsons, they do have these big engines, there's not much we can do about that. What about ATVs? ATVs on the, the we do address those because um, they can't be on the streets. Um, they, they, they're legal, they can't be operated on the streets. And, and again, when we do address those things, we see many bikes on the streets. We see some of these individuals on the streets um, with no helmets. I mean, we was working a call for service and it was popping wheelies on 360 with us. But you know, you gotta put yourself in a police position. Can we really catch that motorcycle? So our hands are kind of tied, but if we can get and find out where the vehicle is um, or where the people are operating, we can address those as violations. But that's a very good question. And we do see that quite a bit, and we know it's going to probably pick up in the, as the weather gets warmer. Very good question. Anything else? Um, I, also, I also live on Meadows Run, too, mm -hmm. and we have a lot of people come through there speeding. Is there any way we can maybe try to get some speed bumps or get a, a speed monitor? on that street? Speed bumps, that's, that's going to be a little bit above me. But yes, you can get a, what we put out on the street, and you guys may have seen it, we call it a stealth stat. A stealth stat, ladies and gentlemen, is when y'all may see a box on a pole, but then you see the two rubber lines in the roadway, that's what it's called a stealth stat. What it does is records vehicle speed at a certain time. And at that time, once we put that stealth stat in the area, which is done by a traffic safety unit, then say we have an increase of 6 a.m. to 9 a.m., and we see vehicles that are doing 50 and 60 in a 35 mile per hour zone, then we'll come out there and address that, that speed of plane at that time, during that time frame. But yes, the answer is yes. As far as getting uh, speed bumps, so that question does come up quite a bit. I want to say, you know, you might want to get with your neighbors um, and see if they wanted to do a petition, and I'm sure it can be brought, brought forward uh, with the county. So, I, so how can we get what you were just talking about on, on our street? As far as the stealth stats? Yeah. Well, no problem with that. I can reach out to traffic safety. I can take care of that. Okay. Just give me your address. Oh. Okay. Yeah, don't give it to him. Anything else? Anything else? This gentleman has one. Okay. If it, Hold up, we got one more. Uh, Officer Parker, I, I don't have a question. I just want to do a shout out. Mm -hmm. uh, I was out at the Texas Roadhouse Wednesday night, and I just happened to stumble across it, and Henrico Police was doing a fundraiser for the Special Olympics, and I believe it's, is it called Tipper Cop? Yes, sir. 
And I can tell you one thing, I was most impressed with that. First of all, I was impressed that the roadhouse let them have it there. And I was impressed with the officers in uniform and what they were doing was working along with the employees serving, had a box up there where you could put some money in for the Special Olympics, uh, had four officers in a country band that I'm gonna tell you were just as good as anything you see on TV. And now here's the best part of their story. My daughters and son-in-law was with me and I had this special privilege. My server was the police chief of Henrico County. I can tell you, to see this big guy walking around with the tray with the sodas and the water on it, it was just fantastic. And I want to say this because here's what impressed me, impresses me with the chief. He was out there with his officers, just like one of them. And uh, of course, it was kind of funny when I was sitting there waiting for my turn, a lady said, uh, is it good or bad that all these officers walk by here and they know you? I said, well, I don't know, I think it's good. <laughs> but anyway, I just want to tell you that the police always get recognized for doing bad things. So I just want to let the folks here know the good things that our police department and our officers are doing. And thank uh, you, sir. I just want to say thank you. Anybody else? One second. Young lady. Okay, I'm sorry. Since Mr. Gothright was doing shout outs, my name is Rose Williams. So I want to shout out Mr. Thorne. I sent a letter out to our community officers for volunteers to come uh, do teacher appreciation. There was three of us, myself, another uh, lady from the neighborhood, and Mr. Thorne. So my shout out to Mr. Thorne is the fact that when you do contact him, he will respond. Even though I gave him short notice, he actually beat me there, and I was chasing him down. It's like I was trying to get here before you do. So he took his time out to come to Glenlee Elementary School to have sign letters and notes to our teachers. And of you parents and grandparents here, I hope that you guys took the time to thank a teacher the first week of May, as Mr. Thorne took the time to do that for the staff at Glenley Elementary School. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So my question is, um, how frequent are these ordinances um, looked at and updated or whatever? How often do they, does the county review their ordinances? can't give a direct answer, but they're pretty up to date. Uh, we review our policy procedural directives yearly. Annually? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I think it's a good one. Oh, wow. <laughs> Look, uh, you know, not, maybe I never referring to her, but uh, a couple of years ago, it was a new home house built in my neighborhood, and this this fella, he had a go. He didn't park his cars in his garage. He played music out of his garage. It was pretty loud before you got to his house. You pass it, and still was playing loud. I mean, it went on for some time. Then he built another new house next to his house. And so this fella came by my house after his house got built, and the music was still going on. When he came to the house, I knew what he was talking about, and he said, "I heard you was the mayor of the area." I said, yes, I am the mayor, but you know, that's, I'm not the mayor, <laughs> but anyhow. And he said, oh, this music is so loud, and said, I don't know what I'm going to do about it. I said, well, I tell you, sir, I said, I, that fellow, I talk to him, I see him and his wife in the grocery store, and I speak. I said, I think that fellow's a nice guy. And I said, I think you ought to just go up there to him and tell him that you would like for him to cut his music down. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard that music played loud since. That's been two years ago. 
friend. So congratulations. But, but be careful if you go to jail. Be careful. <laughs> I don't know what he's doing. Okay. One last exception. Ice cream trucks are exceptions as well. I want to throw that out there. But uh, now we're about to bring this meeting to a close. Mr. Thornton has a few remarks. But I want to bring some to y'all guys' attention that we've been dealing with quite a bit in the county. Um, and it's a little side note from the noise ordinance. And it's dealing with stolen vehicles. Okay. Just for not to give any particular brand out, but we are seeing a trend where certain stolen vehicles, certain models. Um, I can speak to y'all about that, a few of you guys, um, once we're done with the meeting. But people have figured out a way to defeat a security system um, with particular vehicles. Um, I will say, like a Kia vehicle, so to speak. They figured out a way to defeat the security system. So my suggestion to everyone um, is to please if you have a second device, I'm not sure if it's a Charlie lock, Charlie bar that could possibly go on your steering wheel, and that's gonna be for possibly any vehicle, um, to just you know try to use that secondary security device. It, will, it may cost a little bit, I'm not sure, you may just have one in, in, in your home, but just try to be mindful to try to do whatever you can to secure your vehicle and to not let yourself be a victim of a, a crime for just larceny from auto or a stolen vehicle, which means also keep valuables out of sight, you know, cell phones, MacBooks, clothes, jackets, anything, money. Um, just keep those out of sight, lock them in a the vehicle. But again, we're focusing on vehicles such as Kia um, that we're trying to address a few issues that people are defeating a security system um, a certain way. And we're, 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 they're taking them, but we are recovering them as well. But I just don't want you to be a victim. So by all means, please just be mindful of that. If you can just put an extra security feature on your vehicle, within your vehicle, would be a great thing. All right, thank y'all for your time. Okay, we almost at the end, but uh, one of our fine citizens talked about the, one of the greatest police chiefs that we have, and where he is is right in here with us. And uh, uh, I want to mention to the chief, as I mentioned to you, we're going to have a program with him coming up later on. But s since you got those flowers, you're going to say anything, chief? I will. Uh, and, and please, please excuse my appearance. I came here to get a workout in which I did, and I saw this meeting was going on, so I'm, as you all know, I'm trying to get in the best shape I can, because you keep doing this business, you gotta be in shape to keep doing this business. So I will tell you this, uh, and I, 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 I've been in the back, so I've heard everything talking about the noise ordinance. I will say we're working on that. So we've submitted a document uh, to the county manager, it's being looked at by the county attorney now, to address the issue you talk about as far as daytime noise. We get it from all over the county. So it's just not prevalent in your neighborhood, it is all over. And I get it, so we all get it. I, it, it would frustrate me. Um, and so we're working on that. The county attorney is gonna be looking at that. It gives us some teeth in order to take some action because right now, as, as Parker said, it's, you know, we, we're kind of stuck. You know, we can only go by what the law allows us to do and a lot of times we get calls in the daytime and there's nothing we can do. Same thing with the marijuana laws. I mean, I'm not sitting there saying we as police agree with all the laws and legislation that's been that's been put together, we can only go by what they're allowing us to do. And so sometimes our hands are kind of tied and I get the frustration from many of our citizens. But as best we can, we'll try to address those issues. Um, you know, so I, like you said, just give us a call. Uh, you know, we, we try to stress for neighbors to be good to one another, but you, as you know, you're going through it right now. They just don't always abide by that. And that, I know that's difficult. So again, I, I, I don't live far from here. I can walk to my house from here. So when we talk about the racetrack, I, I, I hear it from my, home, my house, so I, I get it. Uh, and so, I, again, if you have anything that you need us to address, please, please call us. And lastly, but not least, last but not least, I will say I did not tell Mr. Garth Wright to say that about me. So, thank you. Okay. As I said, we have the best police chief. Now, let's give a hand to the presenters tonight. Let's give a hand to them. It's, it's uh, Miss Deanna Gibson. Is she here? Would you come up very briefly? She don't give announcement that I have something, and we'll get out of here. Hi, everyone. Oh, Lord. Sorry. <laughs> hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Deanna Gibson. Uh, I'm a longtime Henrico County resident, uh, graduated from Holland Springs, 
a couple decades ago. Uh, I've lived in the Fairfield District for pretty much my entire adult life. Uh, and I am here tonight on behalf of Henrico County Democrats. Um, I am vice chair of membership with uh, Henrico County Dems, as well as a member of Henrico County's uh, Black Caucus. And I am here tonight because we're having a uh, family style picnic um, in a couple of weeks on Sunday, June the 12th, uh, in the afternoon from 4.30 to 7 p.m. at Robinson Park. Uh, that's that little park off of Nine Mile Road. Um, uh, it's on uh, Westover Avenue. <laughs> And um, so just wanted to invite members of the community to come out and um, get to know your local Democrats. Um, so what I, I'm new to the Henrico County Democratic Party, but what I can say, what I've noticed is when you look at the number of people that vote for Democrats, the majority of them live here in Fairfield and in Verida. But what I've noticed on the Henrico County um, Democratic Committee is that the majority of the members are from Three Chop and Tuckahoe and Brooklyn. So I think it's very important that we, oh, those of us that live on this side, I think that we should um, show up and, you know, just find out what's going on. So at this event that we're having this cookout, we've invited all of our local leaders uh, to just come out and talk to us and let us know what they're doing and what they plan to do. Uh, so Mr. Thornton has been invited, um, Tyrone Nelson, Roscoe Cooper, our um, school board member, Lamont Bagby, Jennifer McClellan, Donald McEachin, all of them have been invited. So I know a lot of times people feel like the party doesn't care about them, so this is just the party trying to give back. You know, it's not really any big elections or anything going on. This is really just for us, just to let everyone know what our local electeds are doing for us. So again, it's um, Sunday, June the 12th from 4.30 to 7. And if you want to know more about it, you can just Google us in Rico County Dems. We're on Facebook. We have a website, all that stuff. So it's posted there as well. Thank you, everybody. And ladies and gentlemen, as we are getting ready to conclude, let me say something about a picture, a tableau. And that's a French word for, for, pit, for picture. And that is tonight. Some of you ask a whole lot of questions. And that's how we get progress. Now, some of us didn't hear all the answers that we wanted. But the most beautiful part about it was we had conversation about it. And what I'm going to ask you to do is continue that conversation. And let it first start at where you live. And then and start including some of your colleagues and friends. Talk about it. And after you've done that, stop by the board meeting um, on the second and fourth Tuesday nights and come and talk to us about that. And that's how we get changed also. That's how you help me to help you. A gentleman in the back was asking about um, speed humps. We need to do a lot of things like that, okay? But first of all, we got to make sure that, you know, when we start talking about all of these anomalies and problems that they're having, it may not be other people all the time. Let me say that again. It may not be other people. So let's make sure we have that talk with ourselves. Um, finally, uh, I don't have a whole lot of copies, but I think you need to know certain information. Henrico County has what's called some board scholarships. And these are for our young people, okay? And so, the county is going to give some of them some jobs, okay? Last uh, month, some of you picked this fly up. I don't think we have, a, we don't have any tonight, but I want you to call this number. If you have a, a son or a daughter or a relative who's in high school and would like to, them to have that experience working in government and in Rico County, do call. This is a good experience for them, okay? Uh, this is also called in Rico County's Board Fellowship. It, which is a paid summer opportunity, okay? So just have them to call my number uh, for my administrative assistant, 501-4208. And her name is Mrs. Whitten. And I just ask her to send you a copy of Henrico County's board fellowship, because maybe you may have a daughter or, or cousin or someone would like to participate 
and the fellowship uh, at Hebraico County this summer. Beautiful experience for the youngsters there. Uh, also, we want to acknowledge all the persons who helped put this together. Uh, thank you so much for coming out. You could have been doing something else. You could have been washing the car, sweeping the floor, writing a beautiful letter, but you chose to come here. Thank you for that. Also, I want to thank uh, our officers. You don't get a chance to see and hear the chief every time, every night, okay? Um, also, uh, the young lady who got all this together here, Miss Victoria Davis. Yeah, let's, let's give her a little hand also. <laughs> and we got to be careful about what we say. Because sometimes we say, and say, oh, I didn't say that. And if you would look very carefully, there's a camera in here tonight. <laughs> Let me say that again. There's a camera in here tonight. And I'm pretty sure that that camera panned all over. Now, that's a good thing for you to know because, you know, hey, wonder, did they say that? Or can I get a copy of what happened here? See, that's important. That's what technology is all about. So we have on the camera Jeff Wheatlers. I want to thank him, Wheatl, for that. Let's give Jeff a hand. All right. And to the best, to the best citizens, those are the Fairfield citizens. That's you. Thank you so much for what you've done over the years. And keep on, let's keep on keeping on and drive safely and make sure you get home safely. And let's make sure that we're going to make sure that our communities are the best because we care. Love, God bless, see you next month.